Cisco Electric here reporting this week from somewhere in sunny Florida. Today is Sunday, October 27th, 2024, and this is The Current, weekly EV news in about 10 minutes. Let's kick off with some new product reveals. This past Thursday, October 24th, producer Tim and I stopped in Franklin, Tennessee, just outside of Nashville, in order to witness the public revival of Scout Motors. You'll find our dedicated and detailed Scout revival video over at the Misco Electric Industry Channel, but here's a quick summary. Scout was an American truck and SUV manufacturer from 1958 until 1980. They were a division of International Harvester and were marketed as utilitarian work vehicles. The company folded when a gasoline crisis and a union labor strike coincided. A company called Navistar wound up with the brand and Volkswagen Group acquired Navistar for $3.7 billion back in 2020. Today, Scout is an independent American company registered in Delaware. At the moment, the sole shareholder is Volkswagen Group. It is important to distinguish this situation from other VW subsidiaries such as Porsche, Audi, Lamborghini, and Bentley because Scout's independence allows it to operate outside of Volkswagen's dealership franchise and labor agreements, and Scout intends to sell directly with a 10-minute online ordering process. Scout's leadership team includes CEO Scott Keogh and CTO Burkhard Hunke, who each spent decades with Volkswagen. Tenure with VW is fairly common amongst the executive roster. Chris Benjamin is the lead designer who came from Stellantis, but also has experience designing for Volvo, BMW, and Mercedes. This is the Scout Traveler SUV and Terra pickup, which he designed. These are officially titled as concepts, but we can expect the production vehicles to look very similar. These are body-on-frame vehicles like their Rivian, Ford, and General Motors EV truck competition. Scout is projecting an all-electric range of about 350 miles with 1,000 foot-pounds of torque and a 3.5 second 0 to 60 mile per hour time. Both will have a solid rear axle and locking front and rear mechanical lockers. The pickup is projected to have a towing capacity of 10,000 pounds, while the SUV projection is closer to 7,000 pounds. The ground clearance is just shy of 12 inches and they'll ride on 35 inch tires. The vehicles will be underpinned with an 800 volt architecture, bi-directional charging, and North American charging standard ports as standard. Each is scheduled to hit the market in 2027 with a starting price under $60,000. Back in episode 27 of The Current, we relayed commitments by Scout leadership to offer solar charging and rear steering on the upcoming SUV and truck. We didn't see or hear confirmation about those features during the event. They did, however, announce a series hybrid option called the Harvester, which can burn gasoline to charge a slightly smaller battery pack, enabling up to 500 miles of range. We suspect there are many unannounced features and demand levers remaining it's reasonable to expect Scout to pull those periodically over the years remaining between now and production in order to grow and retain their reservation base. We were able to spend about an hour in a small group setting asking questions of the team in charge of construction at Scout's Blythewood, South Carolina production facility. They showed us the progress they've made since we first reported on the project back on May 19th in episode 11. The facility is designed to support over 200,000 units annually, which will include at least one additional unannounced model. If demand is sufficient, the facility can be expanded to produce well over 400,000 units annually. The grounds will house many suppliers and an upfitting facility where accessories can be added to recent builds. Legacy brands typically leave that kind of work to the dealerships. Customization appears to be central to Scout's marketing strategy and can significantly improve the automaker's profit margin. We saw photos of factory accessories, including serious work equipment like a hay bale spike, snow plow, and winch system, along with conventional lifestyle gear. Again, if you want a lot more detail about Scout, please subscribe over at the Misco Electric Industry Channel to be notified when we publish the dedicated piece. Last year, Americans purchased over 12 million trucks and SUVs. In order to hit full production, the Scout will need to capture about 1.7% of the U.S. market. Do you think they can pull it off with the Traveler and the Terra? On to more new products. 
This week, Ford has released details related to improvements coming to the 2025 Mustang Mach-E. In my opinion, the most notable is the transition to heat pump for more efficient cabin heating and cooling as a standard feature on every trim level. Ford did not quantify the range benefits and we don't know if the heat pump reduces frunk space as it did with the Gen 2 Rivian products. The gear selector has moved from the center console area up to the stock, reducing the parts count and improving usable space. The new model year also adds automatic lane changes using the latest version of available Blue Cruise 1.5, hands-free driving, and a new sport appearance package. There is a new Ford connectivity package as well that includes a 5G Wi-Fi hotspot, in-vehicle app access, and connected navigation with EV trip planning and route guidance. The 2025 Mustang Mach-E goes on sale in early 2025, starting at $36,495 MSRP, which is thousands of dollars lower than the previous model year starting price. When I first reviewed the Mustang Mach-E in 2021, and again with the Rally Edition in 2024, I stressed the need for a heat pump for cold weather residents like me. The other point I keep making is that the Mach-E is billed as a sport utility vehicle, but it lacks a hitch receiver. For me, utility requires the ability to at least mount a bicycle rack. Are there other features that you'd like to see in the Mustang Mach-E to make it even more competitive? While we're talking about Ford, I'd like to recommend a fantastic interview with their CEO, Jim Farley, conducted by our friend Robert Llewellyn over at Fully Charged. Once again, Jim delivers candid insights about the EV market and demonstrates that he fully comprehends the organizational disadvantages Ford must overcome to move forward with his game plan. As he's done in the past, he emphasizes that China is far and away leading the world with EVs and he articulates their lead by several metrics. I have linked that interview in the video's description. On to battery news. Stellantis has announced plans to integrate solid state batteries into their STLA large platform, specifically in a fleet of Dodge Charger Daytona EVs starting in 2026. This initiative in collaboration with Massachusetts-based startup Factorial Energy aims to leverage Factorial's solid-state battery cells. We have reported on Factorial in previous episodes of The Current because of their ongoing relationships with other OEMs such as Mercedes-Benz and Hyundai Group. Factorial's solid-state batteries promise an energy density of over 390 watt-hours per kilogram, a marketed improvement over current lithium-ion batteries, typically ranging around 250 to 270 watt-hours per kilogram. The company is targeting up to 600 miles per charge, while significantly reducing weight and enhancing safety by minimizing fire risks associated with liquid electrolytes. The test fleet will serve as a real-world laboratory, allowing Stellantis and Factorial to validate the technology's performance, durability, and consumer acceptance under everyday driving conditions. Back in 2021, Stellantis made a $75 million investment in Factorial Energy. In 2023, Factorial announced the opening of the largest solid-state battery factory in Massachusetts, with an annual capacity of up to 200 megawatt-hours. They delivered their first B sample cells to Mercedes back in June. This week, Tesla announced their earnings figures for the third quarter. They have exceeded many expectations and sent the share price up 20%, representing a valuation increase of over $160 billion. That change is greater than the market cap of Ford, GM, Stellantis, Rivian, and Lucid combined. Tesla delivered 462,890 vehicles in Q3, a year-over-year -year increase of about 6%. This past week, they also celebrated their 7 millionth vehicle produced on October 22nd at the factory in Fremont, California. Tesla's Q3 revenue slightly missed expectations, coming in at $25.18 billion against the anticipated $25.4 billion. Despite this, the revenue figures were an improvement over the previous quarter. The company achieved gross margin just shy of 20%, reflecting a significant increase of 195 basis points year over year. This improvement was largely due to higher automotive margins, excluding credits, which rose to 17.1%. Speaking of credits, though, 
Tesla collected the second highest quarter of regulatory credit revenues with $739 million. As a reminder, other automakers pay Tesla this money in order for them to remain compliant with environmental regulations. Tesla's energy business achieved a record gross margin of 30.5%. Their supercharger network expanded by 2,800 stalls, which is a 22% increase compared to the previous year's deployment rate. They also showed off plans for a new supercharger location they're calling Oasis. Located in the village of Lost Hills between San Francisco and Los Angeles, the site will have a whopping 168 supercharging stalls. It will utilize an 11 megawatt solar system with 10 megapack stationary storage units for a total of 39 megawatt hours. The Oasis charging site is scheduled to open in mid-2025 and demonstrates Tesla's industry-leading vertical integration. Back to earnings, CEO Elon Musk offered an optimistic outlook predicting a 20% to 30% vehicle growth in 2025. He attributed the growth to advancements in autonomy and new lower-cost vehicles which will debut during the first half of 2025. Elon also said he expects unsupervised full self-driving to be launched in the first half of 2025 across current models. He mentioned that he's unsure if older hardware 3 models will have enough compute power to handle unsupervised self-driving. If it is not, he said Tesla will retrofit those vehicles with hardware 4 at no cost. While most OEMs are experiencing slower EV division growth, it is encouraging to see Tesla breaking their own quarterly sales records while maintaining healthy profit margins. Well, that wraps up today's episode. If you found value in the current, I hope you'll consider sharing this link to this episode online. I hope you'll join me on other social media platforms, including X, LinkedIn, and Instagram for up to the minute insights and exclusive coverage. Thank you so much for watching and until next week, drive, fly, ride, go electric.